If you look at this drone, right in the center, you'll notice something a little unusual. There's an entire piece missing. And that's not a mistake. Over the past year, I've been developing my own drone, which is the Archetype. And in the process, I've been digging into how FPV drones really handle stress, from vibrations to crash energy to oscillations. And so in this video, I wanna zoom in on all of that. I wanna show you a side of FPV drones that most people never even think about. These drones that we fly push the limits of material, engineering, and control that at their limits, if these forces aren't managed correctly, can catastrophically fail. So let me show you what I've been looking into. And don't worry, we will get to this gap here. And by the end, it'll make sense why it's there and why it matters. I want to start in 1940. This is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, a massive suspension bridge that had only been opened for four months. And on what seems like a slightly windy day, something unexpected started to happen. The bridge started to move. And at first it was just small, gentle swaying, but then the motion started to grow and quickly got out of control. Only a 35 mile an hour wind is blowing, but this apparently sets up a rhythmic swinging of the bridge, which increases with each swing. Seemingly out of nowhere, the whole structure began to contort, bending and twisting in these huge, slow waves. Each swing was bigger than the last, and the longer it went on, the more violent it became. Finally, the swinging road and the suspension cables give way and plunge into the water below. What happened here was a result of something called resonance. Every object has a frequency it naturally prefers to vibrate at. And this is called the resonant frequency. Even things that seem solid or completely still, like a table, a bridge, or a glass, will vibrate a tiny amount if you hit or shake them. A classic example is a wine glass. If you strike it, it will ring at its resonant frequency. Now that vibration will fade unless that same frequency is fed back into the glass. So when those opera singers break a glass, what they're actually doing is singing the resonant frequency of the glass. And because of that, the glass is constantly absorbing more and more of that energy. You can see in this example that if you record this resonant frequency after you hit it, amplify it a bit and then play it back, the glass will break. And that's exactly what happened with the bridge. The wind happened to hit it at just the right angle, at just the right rhythm, matching the bridge's resonant frequency. So what happens when the same phenomenon creeps into our drones? Oh, hi there, Nick. Hi, good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing all right, mate. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, my name's Chris Rosser. I am an aerothermal engineer by background, by training, and I've been flying FPV for the last, ooh, I don't know, six seven years now this is the guy that introduced this concept to drones and it's become one of the most important conversations in frame design the vibration on drones is primarily generated from the spinning motors and props they're never perfectly in balance and so as they spin they create vibrations at the frequency at which they're rotating and just like any object the frame itself has a resonant frequency and the problem occurs if the motors are spinning at the same frequency as the arms want to bend up and down. It will then put energy into that mode. Effectively, the, the frame is storing that energy. Um, eventually, you know, the vibration will get really big and that happens quite quickly. Now, to understand how this affects drone flight, we first need to understand how the drone moves. If you're unfamiliar with FPV drones, when someone talks about manual mode in a drone like this, it gives the impression that there's no stabilizing or self-leveling going on. Like if you roll to the right, the motors on the left side just spin up faster. But that's not actually the case. See, when you move the stick to the right and then stop moving it, the computer inside the drone is going to try to keep it at that spot that you let go of. And so it'll fight any outside forces on the drone, whether that be wind or momentum. Which is why when you do a spin and then stop halfway, it doesn't keep rolling with the momentum because that would be an outside force. And the same thing that makes drones flyable can also become its weak point when it has trouble understanding where it positionally is in space. Flight controllers in FPV drones have uh, various software filters which are designed to kind of remove those vibrations and um, they do a pretty good job in general. What can cause problems is if your airframe is not stiff enough or has nasty resonance characteristics, which means that the vibrations from the motors are being amplified by the frame and that 
amplified vibration is getting through into the flight controller. The drone computer is trying to ignore vibrations and all it's trying to do is pay attention to the actual movement of the drone as a whole. Now you can actually see what movement the drone is seeing using the black box log of the drone. And if you take it out for a flight, you'll end up with a graph that looks like this. Along the bottom is the frequency, basically how fast the movements are. Up and down shows how much vibration the drone has at each of these speeds. When you see a tall spike like this on the graph, that's a frequency that the drone likes to vibrate at. It's resonant frequency. But this section here is the actual movement of the quote. The faster it's moving or spinning, the higher up it's going to be on this graph. If you tell a DJI drone, turn left, turn right, turn left, turn right, and you do it as fast as you can, it won't turn that quickly. Yeah. If you take a tightly tuned like five inch race frame and you tell it go left, go right, go left, go right, it will snap back and forth almost instantly. That's the difference between a low flight frequency and a high flight frequency. It's to do with how fast the thing reacts to your stick inputs. All of this stuff up to about, well, in this case, about 90 Hertz, that is real movement, real movement of the quad up to about here. Then we have this little bump here, that is a resonance. That is a problem because it's right in the middle of what I call the quiet zone, right? You know, if we could, if that bump wasn't there, we'd have this like quiet band. And then you have to start getting problems when stuff ends up in that gap, like frame resonances or antennas or whatever, antenna wobbling is in that gap because you can't filter it out. And then it comes through in mainly in the D term. The reason this quiet zone is so important is it separates the actual movement of the drone and this resonance. And that way you can tell the computer to ignore everything on this side because this is the real movement. So you can see the effect of the filters and they really crush this down. You can see the low frequency stuff doesn't change at all. This is your actual stick inputs and flight. You can't get rid of this, otherwise the quad won't fly right. Now, to keep these noise separate, it relies on having a really stiff frame, which is why FPV drones are made from carbon fiber. About a year ago, I tried to 3D print a functional drone frame, and the result is what happens when the frame isn't rigid enough, and the noise and the flight frequencies collide. Oh god! The drone can't tell the difference between noise and real movement. Okay, so if 3D printed frames wouldn't work, um, or just hard to get a stiff frame out of it, then what would you say is the reason like DJI drones don't experience vibrating or resonance? Is it just because they're, I guess, less aggressive? DJI drones have very low flight frequencies because they are not very responsive drones. A DJI drone will cruise around and will have flight frequencies that are in like the single digit hertz. It's something like the Avata, which is more of like an FPV style drone, will we'll, we'll go a little higher than that. But but it's still super low frequencies, right? Like you're never you're never getting to the sort of really sharp responsive moves that like a typical FPV freestyle drone would do, which will have frequency components higher than that. And that means that they can get away with soft floppy frames because if you've got low flight frequencies, you can still have a low frame resonance and, and then you can still filter that out. So because DJI drones move a lot slower, the range of speeds that it moves is all the way down here. Now the resonant frequency where this spike normally happens is probably going to be a lot lower, but because it's movement and frequencies are still separate, it still works. That's a fundamental limit to like how snappy and responsive a DJI drone can be. It's got to have flight frequencies below a certain level because because the frame isn't super stiff. So if you if you were to try and tune like a DJI drone to respond like a race frame, if you could, I mean DJI don't let you change the PID parameters, you would start having issues with vibration very quickly and you would not be able to tune it very tightly. Because as you push those flight frequencies up, they would start to like get close enough to the resonant frequencies of the frame that it would cause problems. And that's why DJI drones can't fly aggressively. But how do you keep these frequencies separated? The things you can do to help that is you can compress your flight frequencies down so you can slow how fast the drone moves and make it more smooth and really compress those down so that the flight frequencies are at low frequency. And then you can try and create space by crushing them down, making the drone slow. Or you can try and move the frame resonances up to create some space. And this is the better way to handle vibrations. And it's also where frame design comes into this. 
As the frame vibrates, the energy needs to be dissipated before it reaches the flight controller. And the main way that this happens is through damping, which is pretty much the process of turning vibration energy into heat. Now in drones, there are two main forms of damping. The first is material damping, which is the inherent ability of a material to dissipate vibration energy on its own. Now, if we think back to the example we mentioned before, a wine glass has terrible damping properties. So when you hit it, it vibrates for a really long time. But a rubber tire like this will have really good damping properties. So if you hit it, it just makes a dull thud. Now, carbon fiber actually sits somewhere in the middle between these two. It's actually pretty good at damping vibrations, but it's obviously not perfect because we still need it to be rigid and strong for flying. So there's always gonna be that trade-off. The next form of damping in drones is friction damping. This happens when two plates or surfaces rub microscopically against each other, converting those tiny relative movements into heat. In Chris Ross's video, he explains that this is why frames with more joints often handle vibrations better. The additional interfaces between parts creates more opportunity for friction damping. And this is why you see arms being sandwiched between two plates. The same thing we've done for the archetype. So if all this thinking and intentional design goes into stopping vibrations, the next logical question is, I guess, is there anything else that is just as overlooked, but also just as critical as this? And I think there is. If you pull apart a drone, in the center, you'll eventually run into this tiny piece of carbon called a keystone. The common assumption is that this is just here to brace the arms and make sure that all the parts in here are pressed against each other. But that's not the full story, because this little piece is using an engineering idea that predates drones by decades. Specifically, in car design. Now, it's pretty common knowledge that originally cars were made to be incredibly stiff, which means that all the force from a crash would go straight into the passenger and it would be quite unsafe. So the next thing they did was add a crumple zones to manage the force in a crash. But there's more to this than just making the front of the car weaker. Engineers realized they could actually redirect and control where forces traveled during a crash. Instead of letting the energy shoot straight into the cabin, they designed load paths. Intentional routes in the chassis that guided the force through specific parts of the frame. With a modern car, when it hits something head on, the bumper beam takes the first hit, but the force doesn't continue straight backwards. It gets split and pulled into multiple parts. Some goes upwards through the A-pillars, some travel along the floor rails, some gets pushed sideways into the rocker panels, and some is redirected around the wheel wells and outer frame. Basically, the car is doing everything it can to steer the crash energy away from the people inside. So the car isn't just absorbing the impact, it's redistributing it across many structural members so no single piece takes the full hit. If one path gets overwhelmed, another takes over. And freestyle frames use the same principle, but at a much smaller scale. Yeah, so having a thing in the middle that just purely like compresses the arms and locks them all together is probably not going to do anything for vibration performance. Like some of the parts that you're talking about, like the keystone parts, are like spine, like a spine part that goes down the middle of the frame that attaches front and rear arms together. So they're good. They're typically good for durability because they help spread the load in a crash situation. Put simply, when you crash your drone, one arm usually takes the first hit, but instead of letting that force slam into the center plate or snap that single arm on its own, the keystone gives that energy a predictable path to follow. By routing the impact through the keystone, the frame can spread that load across a larger, stronger structure instead of letting one arm take everything. The keystone becomes the controlled pathway for crash energy, redirecting it, absorbing some of it, and reducing the chance that that single arm fails. And this is where that gap comes in. By having no contact points between each arm, you make sure that the load is distributed evenly. So it's not gonna cross from one arm to the other directly, all the force goes through the keystone. All right, I know this is all really technical and kind of abstract because it all happens at a level that you don't even see, but that's kind of the point. The fact is that these tiny details from how a flight controller responds to input to what happens to the drone in a crash is what makes a frame good and reliable so that you can not focus on that and just focus on the flying part. This was a portion of the work that I put into making the archetype. So um, if you want to grab one of these, 
link down below. And of course, this whole video, this whole conversation wouldn't even be possible without Chris Rosser. The dude is the MVP of FPV. So yeah, his details are down below in the pinned comment. Thanks for watching. I, uh, I hope you learned a thing or two.